All right, all right, all right. Just like Joey Ramone said, hey ho, let's go. Hello, my legendary friends. I'm really glad you joined us for this episode of Legends and Losers. Uh, today, we're going to shine a light on a uh, segment of the entrepreneurial world um, that it turns out a lot of people call the most important in our economy. And um, as you well know, I'm no economist, but I, uh, I could tell you, the people who are uh, entrepreneurs, uh, small entrepreneurs, uh, small businesses, uh, solopreneurs are incredibly important. So let's crack open some of the data. According to the U.S. Small Business Administration, um, there are about 29 million small businesses in the U.S. alone. And um, they have about uh, 57 million employees. And they define a small business as a company with 500 or less people. And get this, small businesses, 500 or less, account for 99.7% of all the businesses in the U.S. Now, uh, recently you've probably heard a lot about either the gig economy or sol solopreneurs or, or things along those lines. And um, as you know, my partner in the show uh, and co-host um, Colin, his company, Equity Directory, it lives in the gig economy and it connects um, startup entrepreneurs with people who are willing to uh, provide services to them uh, for either all equity or part equity. And so you're starting, and they're just emblematic of what we're seeing. Uh, you know, Elance was an early pioneer in, in this regard. And, and we're starting to see all these, of course, uh, LinkedIn itself, all these ways in which companies connect with a specialized talent who can do, um, who can do certain things for them. And the great thing is, if you want to be a solopreneur, of course, um, it allows you to design your life and your business as, as one and the same. Um, you know, I, I have quite a few friends who are uh, realtors and I think that's uh, one of the things that attracts some people to real estate is the ability to have flexibility over their uh, schedule and so forth. Now, according to, um, businessnewsdaily.com, there are about 18 million solopreneurs, uh, in the U S today. Now, that's all germane because of who our guest is today on the show, J.V. Crum III. And um, J.V. is one of the most popular modern thought leaders, uh, authors, coaches, and podcasters for people in this kind of segment. So if you're a coach, if you're an author, you're a speaker, or you're an entrepreneur, which you might think of as a small e entrepreneur, you probably know J.V. and there's a very good chance you subscribe to his podcast. Um, his show, Conscious Millionaire, has been named one of the top shows by Inc. Magazine and has been heard by over 12 million listeners. He has a new podcast called Conscious Millionaire Health uh, that's also been a very big hit. And uh, we'll talk about the health circumstance that JV found himself in and, uh, and what he's doing to, uh, to, uh, to heal as quickly and effectively as possible. JV is a Huffington Post columnist. He's the author of the bestseller, Conscious Millionaire. Grow your business by making a difference. And now, the legendary J.V. Crum III. So, J.V., tell me something legendary. Legendary? Well, you want something legendary about me or something legendary about the external world? Well, if I could be greedy, what about both? <laughs> okay, why don't we be greedy? Um, depends on how you define legendary. Uh, but I think it was kind of legendary that I grew up in a little poor town with in a family that had no money and was challenged and at five figured out that I was going to grow up and be a millionaire and that that was the solution to the problem and that I never once doubted it for a moment. Once I got the vision and fully internalized it, which took only a few moments, uh, I saw that vision uh, through fruition at 25, and but never once doubted it. Never. And, and where did you grow up, JB? Oklahoma, Florida. Now, you, you're probably thinking, oh, yeah, I've been to Oklahoma. I vac vacation there all the time. But in case you haven't been there on Lake Weir, by the way, four by five mile lake, you might have heard of Ma Barker, the gangster group. Oh, we love Usually, gangsters here on Lake Yeah, who went and robbed uh, banks <laughs> in Atlanta eight miles, eight uh, hours away in their black Lincoln. And they lived two blocks away from where I grew up. And they were shot out. Oh, gosh. Um, probably not that long before I was born, 
And so their house was all boarded up and still had the holes in it from when the FBI found them and came and just machine gunned the whole house and killed the whole mom, mom and her, all her kids. And so we used to take uh, tangerines off the tangerine tree in our yard. And the fence was just, the gate was just, could be pushed just enough. And we're little, we're five or six. And we'd go out on Ma Barker's dock and have our tangerine. We thought we were so cool. You know, I love it. So that's legendary in my background. And so how did you connect that at five to, I want to be a millionaire? Well, because literally I grew up in a really strict household. And when I would go to the grocery store, I'd been trained not to ask for a candy bar because we actually didn't have the money to pay for the candy bar. And one day I decided I was tired of this kind of life and that I wasn't going to stand for it and that I was going to do something about it. And so it just seemed, you know, it's like I literally was sitting around pondering, you know, as if I were some great philosopher, what's the solution to this problem? And then I said to myself, I remember it was by the kumquat tree, by the way. So Buddha <laughs> had his lotus plant, but I was by the kumquat tree. So there was a spiritual component to this. Uh, well, I think there was, absolutely. Uh, I, I think it was my divine providence, and I'm not being, uh, I'm not joking. I think wow. it was my future. And I saw it, and I claimed it, and I said, that's the answer. That's I the will answer. grow up and be a millionaire, and I'll always be able to buy the candy bar. And I'll, I'll solve this candy bar problem. I'm going to solve this. Yeah, so in many ways, I think this was the vision of how to, how to get the candy bar. And did, did you tell your mom that? Or, oh, I uh, did. I ran in the house, and I told my parents, because it was like I had discovered water. This was Eureka. Hmm. And I remember it very specifically because my mother – shook her finger at me and told me not to tell anybody. My parents were ashamed. What, because money was a rude thing to talk about? Well, because when you grow up in a little town with everybody's poor, everybody has a poor mentality. And we lived, I didn't understand at, at the age of five, but when I wrote my book, my editor said, you know, you've got to explain this to your audience. You can't just say these things. You've got to say, why did this happen? And I pondered that for quite a while. And I realized we lived across the street from the little country church. And my parents believed if you had that much money, you must have done something wrong. And they yeah. didn't want their son to grow up to be a bad person. Isn't that so funny? You know, I grew up in Montreal, Canada, and there was this context that people who were rich had to be crooks. Exactly. And that's what my parents had internalized. Of course, it didn't help them have financial abundance to have that kind of belief system. But being a little kid, um, I did go around. I did tell everybody in town. And uh, I can imagine that there were a lot of what I called little old ladies. I didn't mean that disparagingly. Their husbands had died and they'd moved there you know, from the north. And um, I went by James initially. Uh, that was my first incarnation was James. Um, James. I mean, not that the, James is a very cool man. Well, I was James stuff, until but. I was eight, and then I was Jim until I was seventeen, and then I went off to college, and I was JV. How did how did you get to be JV at college? Uh, well, my parents wouldn't let me be called JV at home. My grandfather had gone by JV and died two years before I was born, uh -huh. so everybody talked about him with such adoration that I decided at an early age I wanted to be JV. But my parents strict. And lots of belief systems that were not necessarily founded in logic, right? <laughs> and so they kept telling me, you're too young, quote unquote, to be JV. So I thought, well, when I go to college, I'll just be JV. And it took them four years before they would call me that. But I finally just uh, refused to even correspond or answer them in any way until they changed and called me JV. It's funny, my friend Rhonda Smith, who uh, was kind enough to moderate a Q&A panel on Legends and Losers recently, she, she says something to the, I'm paraphrasing, but she says, our name is the first contract that's forced upon us. Right, interesting. Right, we don't. Well, you know, it, I, I, I think, you know, when you started by Legends, I think the reason, because I just did it intuitively, but now I'm going, well, so why did I spend all this time talking about this little country town of Oklahoma? Because when people meet me today, I don't think someone knows me until they know I'm a country, little country boy at heart who we ran around barefoot and we didn't have any money because you get certain values. I think all, my honesty, my integrity, my if somebody was sick, I wouldn't mow their lawn. Um, I think a lot of who I am comes out of this little country town where people didn't lock their doors. 
Uh, yeah. People cared about one another. We went to church three times a week, even though twice a week we were the only family there. Um, <laughs> what were I assume one was Sunday. What were the other two days? Oh, Sunday night and Su- Sunday morning and night and night. Even did you have to wear different outfits, or how did that? How <laughs> did that work? I don't remember what we wore Sunday night. And well, then why Wednesday twice night? on Sundays? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. And, I don't, and was there? I don't know. And, and, Wednesday. and Wednesday night. Yeah. It was just, interesting. Uh, it was a Methodist church. Um, and by the time I was nine, I remember saying, I think I'll just go to seminary because uh, it seems like I might as well get paid for going to church. Uh, so which, you could have you, you you been the, the reverend? I could have. I was actually pre-seminary for a year after Were I was pre-med. Really? Yeah, I went to uh, Wake Forest and I was pre-med. I was going to go to med school. I was in this honors program to go through and do it real fast. As you I, would be, JV. <laughs> but I decided I didn't think it was the right journey for me because I would go to physics, physics lab and chemistry lab and I'm number heavy. You know, I ended up getting a tax, tax, you know, law lawyer. So I'm very number heavy. So I go to physics and chemistry lab and I knew what was going on. And then I go to biology lab and I was smart enough to make it through the lab. Yeah. But I had no idea what was going on. And one day it just hit me. What, what do you mean you had no idea what was going on? I didn't know. I didn't understand it. It just intuitively made no sense whatsoever. So even I mean, though you were tracking the stuff, I just, the, 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 you know, I just, you know, like when we would look in the microscope and they go, see the cancer cell. And I go, looks like the other cell to me. And I go, huh? I finally figured out that intuitively I wasn't getting the same hit that my friends were getting. So they were, yeah. So maybe this wasn't for you. Is that what you, yeah. One day I made a decision. My parents were not very thrilled, but I made a decision Hmm. not to go to med school. I've never, do you remember how old you were JV? I was 19. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I, yeah, I no, maybe I was 18. 18. I started college when I was 17. So no, I was 18, 18 or I just turned 19. And I called my parents uh, back when you had pay phones and all that. And um, they were extraordinarily unhappy for about six months. But remember, I grew up in this little poor kind of place, and they had to scrimp and save for me to go to Wake Forest, and I was going to go to Bowman Gray. So this was like their son. So were, were they able to help pay for your education? Yeah. yeah. Wow. We were, it was a very, you know, uh, we go through all these different periods. So being a white male in a quote unquote middle middle class family almost precluded me from all scholarships, even though we had no money. <laughs> it was just the wrong time to just, be a white just male. Just kind of a class. little bit of reverse discrimination. Is that what's was, going on, was, JV? It, yeah, it was. Yeah, this is the seventies, and it was going on because I wanted to go to Harvard, but that was really out of the question, you know, because I just couldn't. I just couldn't get the the scholarships. I was I had a four zero, so you don't know what else I could have done, but. Um, no, I was I couldn't get the scholarship. So um, there you are. That's that's just the part well, of that era. The good news is the movie didn't end too badly for JV. <laughs> well, no, it, it, it ended okay. Uh, so yeah, so I think that country. I think that it's really important to honor the journey that we've taken because who I am today and who I'm going to be five years from now is very very different on the outside or what somebody would perceive than that little country boy at five who decides Mm. to grow up and be a millionaire. But if you don't know that that's who I am at my core, I don't think you know me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So let's maybe fast forward to now. Seven or eight or, and then we can fill in gaps along the way. Cause maybe that'd be fun because, uh, who you are today is, um, you know, uh, Pretty extraordinary. I mean, you built uh, an amazing uh, international business, and um, you're a. I don't. You tell me if this is you know the way to think about it. But I, I you're a social media star. You're a podcast star. You've uh, built an incredible following and and a great coaching and, and training business for people who are um, you know wanting to build their services business. So. Um, you know, what's it like today to be J.V. Crumb? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because I think um, to a large degree, a lot of me still sees me as that little country boy. Um, I, let me say this because I, 
And sometimes I think when I say things, maybe they'll sound arrogant or something. I think I'm. This is a show where you can behave badly. You can yeah, be arrogant. You, well, you, I'm behaving you badly. I think <laughs> on my on my health reality show. Uh, I, I, I the next one's already cut. You and know. Uh, you know you can wow. you can be as radical as you want here, as well, we but talked about. I, I think I'm I'm so interested. It's like we were talking before going to air that I really think I'm going to shave my head. But if I shave my head, I'm shaving my head. Like I'm done, done. Like. Like I'm at, I'm on this new path. Now, and you know, what, what in, makes you think you want to shave your head? Is it is it is it my good looks or? <laughs> well, well, that was it when I was. When you were on the show, you know, you thought, I, said, I should shave my head. I should shave my head. Well, I, you know, I lived at a Buddhist monastery for a little while, and then I went and lived in Boulder, and I actually had a one cut, and it actually looked good. But I'm, I'm, I, I'm moving. I can feel it. It's not an intentional thing. It's I'm moving into a higher uh, space of, of spirituality for myself. And I know that with what I'm going through with the diabetes and healing that has had such a profound effect on all of my life because the fact that within four hours I said, oh, this health show I have, let's turn it into a reality health show and follow me because I'm going to heal. You know, and I fired the first doctor because she told me I couldn't. So, it's so, so yeah, my let, let's life. go back to r- r- remind me again. When when did you get diagnosed? Ten weeks ago. Ten weeks. Uh, and, it seems and, like a few years. And and uh, share with me. I you got so you your doctor says, oh shit. The you numbers know, I, are I've never bad. seen this doctor before, but you know how our crazy health system works. So it was December twenty eighth, and I um needed to get a health physical and I'd moved to Colorado. So I didn't have a doctor and I actually had no strategy for how to get a doctor. Cause I hadn't gotten a doctor in t- 20 years, you know, you know, I did, didn't know how to go. You, you didn't, you didn't go to a doctor for 20 years, Jamie. No, I had the same doctor. for 20 years. Oh, I see. I got it. Yeah. So I didn't have any strategies. Right. Cause you go. moved of course. Duh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that, anyway, that's hard, right? I mean, I had the same, hard. I had the same it's, doctor it's, for 20 years. It's and, hard when you're very holistic and, yeah. And you already kind of think a lot of Western medicine is a bunch of BS anyway. Uh, and then you got to find a doctor. So I had a friend refer me. And um, the short story is, you know, our relationship lasted for about two hours. Um, she told me she was completely traditional Western. I told her I was holistic. She told me I had diabetes. I told her I was going to heal. She told me it was impossible and that holistic approaches to diabetes don't work. And all but ordered me to take insulin, and I went and meditated for four days at Shambhala Center because it was the end of the year, and I bought a four-day meditation retreat, so I thought that was more as, important. As you do. <laughs> yeah. where, where is the meditation, meditation retreat, uh, Jim? Uh, it's up, up above uh, Boulder for about an hour. Yeah. Isn't that well, – when you move to Colorado, don't you get like a free pass to one of these places? Yeah, I think, I think, <laughs> I think so. You, you get know. that and, and a weed card, don't you get that? <laughs> Oh, that's and, 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 it would be right. great if they gave you a ski pass too. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, so I just, I told her in my mind, I'm already healed, which I'm sure she thought, you know, at that point, I, I'm sure by the time I left, she thought I was nuts, but that didn't really matter to me. Um, so within four hours, I said, well, I'm going to heal, which I, I mean, for gosh, I mean, I'm at 146 yesterday on my sugars and 10 weeks ago is 436. That's 290 points. And in 46 Incredible. points, I'll be in the midpoint of normal. So, doing, so we were talking about this a little bit earlier. A hundred is, is where you want to be ultimately. Is that right? No, 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 no. It's not where I want to be. It's where uh, I will be. That's where you will be. You got it. Yeah, but but healthy is a hundred. I, I don't know anything about uh, this. Um, like, 90 to 110. 90 to 110. So I just chose the midpoint. Seemed like a good place yeah, to go. Yeah, got it. And then and, my and mind so, so in how many weeks you got diagnosed ten, from this doctor? Ten, so ten, ten weeks. weeks. Wow. And, and, and how do you feel, man? I mean, what does you, what, what, well, your body feel, feel? How does your life feel? I feel, feel? Uh, radically empowered because I made a declaration that for me was real. I mean, I, I, when I said in my mind, you see, I have a reference point because when at five, we'll just go back to that. I have lots of reference points like this, by the way, that something happens and I just done. I've already made my decision. In my mind, it's already complete. And now we just have to figure our path forward. And it doesn't in any way bother me that I don't know how I'm going to get there because that's just taking the path. And the path, 
the path, all you really have to know is the step you're taking. And I yeah. know that you hear stuff like that, but I actually kind of live that way. And so, you know, I said the best thing I can do is to take this story public. I had no idea when I made that decision how angry I was going to become because I am now extremely well, angry. Why were you angry, JB? I'm angry at Western medicine for telling people such blatant lies that they can't heal and taking the, the pharmaceutical companies making billions and billions. I think the number is something like $238 billion off of diabetes. So have you not taken any insulin? No, zero. So what are the kinds of things you've been doing? I changed my, my, I radically changed my food patterns. So what are the kinds of things you used to eat and what, what do you eat now? Well, these are the things I took out immediately the next morning. So I went to meditate, but I took all these foods out first. All potatoes, all grains, all flours, added sugar, except I allow five grams of sugar a day. Uh, and um, all the um, processed uh, meats because of all the chemicals that I just threw in for good measure. So you mean uh, like any packaged meats or something like that? Yeah, there's a couple of packaged meats that I will buy because they don't have any nitrates or anything in them. But basically, uh, I'm not buying that stuff. But the main stuff was to take out the sugars, the flours, all so all the processed carbs, all the grains, and all the potatoes. But you take that. And stuff isn't it amazing out, how much of that shit is just creeps into our diet? Well, you know, I went through my refrigerator uh, when I did this. You know, it's like a very uh, cathartic process. And I had to throw out half of my refrigerator, the ketchup, the relish, the barbecue sauce, all this stuff. I, oh, there's I no, sh there's no sugar in ketchup. Is there JV? But it turns <laughs> out there is uh, a, a, a lot of corn syrup. All that stuff went away. Oh, fucking I just threw it all in the garbage. Yeah. Amazing. I said, nope, I'm not going to even give it to anybody. It's bad for people. So I'm just going to throw it all away. I did that. I take bitter melon. I visualize and I'm working out. And I, I'm certified in hypnosis, so I created a hypnotic audio for myself that I listen to that instructs my pancreas to make the exact amount of uh, insulin that my body needs. And then it instructs my insulin receptor cells or my cells to allow the insulin to come in and to transport the sugar across the cell so, membrane. So you're reprogramming your body through your Absolutely. mind. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? And so and all what kind of working out are you doing, JB? Uh, you know, uh, they've got to hire me as a spokesman. I think I'm giving them way too much advertising, but it's yeah. okay. Uh, Orange Theory. I'm going to Orange Theory. And it's really working for you, isn't it? Well, this month I have 24 sessions scheduled, 24 wow. days at Orange Theory. That's fantastic. Uh, uh, yeah. And way to go, I feel JB. super healthy, but it has radicalized my approach to business. How so? In, in how have you, how's your health and your business connected? Uh, because I made these radical decisions about how I was going to live. And all of a sudden it changed who I wanted to work with. It changed how I wanted to present the company. Uh, I went through a month where I put high achiever all over the website. I've now pretty much removed it, but I left the, the, the feeling of it that if somebody doesn't want to, if somebody wants to go, this is what I, I figured out. I don't care where you are right now. You can have $10 billion. But if you want to go to your next level, I'm 100% clear that I can help you get there. And I'm also clear that if you don't want to go to your next level, I don't care how much you want to pay me. I don't want to work with you. And then I got much more. So better. only if, if you're the coach, if you're the master sensei, you only want to work with the committed student. If you're not committed, I, I don't want your money. I don't yeah. want to work with you. Because I, I know I'm how you feel, JB. <laughs> clear about how much impact I could make with the rest of my life, but I can only make that impact if I make the impact with people who are ready to make impact with their lives. And that revolutionized. I rewrote my website. I think I've now rewritten it three times in ten years. But wasn't I mean? This doesn't sound like a surprise for people who know you. I mean, shit, JB. Yeah, your book's called cl Conscious I, Millionaire. I, I mean, your I know, whole I wasn't as I wasn't as in your face. Uh, so um, you you taken some shackles off? I have. Well, I, it, what was it about uh, health scare and, and, and now your numbers doing so great? And I mean, what was it about that that made you, if you will, double down on your... your yeah, because, I, uh, because, because of the fact that the vast majority, because I keep running into lots of people now, you know, with my... Because I talk about this everywhere I go. And so I run into all these people who are taking, you know, all these medications 
and they're eating pancakes and they're eating chocolate and they're eating candies and they're eating ice cream. I'm just, wow. I'm going, you know, if you would cut that out, you don't need this medication that you could actually be healthy. And then I got clear about three or four weeks ago, because Matrix is one of my favorite movies, that really this was the blue pill and the red pill. And I had made the decision to take the red pill. And that all these other people were staying in this conventional reality that says you can't get healthy, you'll always be sick, and you have a disease. Three weeks ago, I realized my mind said, you don't even have a disease. It's not even a disease. That's a hoax. It's a condition you created, and now you're uncreating it. So sometimes when you go through something like this, I mean, 436 is off the charts. It's really high. And I said, keep your insulin. So it's... And what number, uh, educate me here a little bit, JB, what number are you officially a diabetic? 126. You're a diabetic at 126? Yeah, and 111, you're pre-diabetic. And I was 436. Holy fuck, did they want to like tie you into a stretcher (laughs) and hook you up to some kind of a crazy... She she basically ordered me to take insulin and I obviously didn't. So... The thing that, you know, it's like sometimes it's, all right, yes, all that information was there, and yes, that was who I was. But sometimes when you go through something as radical as this, and you make a radical decision, and you go, no, I'm taking the red pill, I don't care what you think, all of a sudden, it's like lots of layers and scales came off my eyes, And while I might be saying things, it just dawns on me as you're asking this question, I might be saying things that are not that different than what I said 11 weeks ago, but inside they have so much more power because I see so much more clearly. Yeah, your commitment to them, your your clarity around. And I see the possibilities of what I can do with my life in a whole new light. So like what, JV? I mean, mean, you're a guy. If I did this, if I did this, what can I do in terms of helping other people transform their lives at a completely different level than I ever even thought about? So that's why I'm really much more just I'm clear out there that you've got to be committed because I want you to go someplace and I can help you get there. It, it's just seeing life so much more clearly. It's like when you meditate And you realize experientially that you are connected with everything and everything is one. And it's not just a thought. It's not just intellectual. It's experiential. And I think that's the difference. Going through this diabetes healing experience is so um, experiential that I feel it in, in, at every level of my body that I realize that I'm not just healing my body. I'm healing my mind. I'm healing my emotions. I'm healing my spiritual nature. And that, that's why I'm talking about, oh, and I'm going to, I think I'm going to shave my head because I kind of want more of a, a monk-like spiritual experience with the rest of my life. Because In, so in my case, that's you. not what it was about. It was just, <laughs> I didn't, <laughs> it, it was receding and it was either hold on and look like a douchebag or just go for it. <laughs> so whatever monk-like shaved head I, quality I have, it was accidental. Um, but I get what, I get what you're saying. You think, you think that shaving your head would be, a visual uh, reminder of your commitment to your well-being and kind of doubling down on your mission to make a difference for people? Well, now that you asked that question, I do, I do think that'd be true, although it's not my motivation. My motivation is more the experiential piece of um, having, when I lived in Boulder, the fact that I had like a one cut, which is pretty close to shaving your head. Uh And I remember when the hair came off that, you know, hair has emotion in it. And all of a sudden I was just felt clearer and cleaner, you know, more connected in a spiritual way. It's funny that you say that because when I let mine go uh, longer than I normally do, uh, it's, it, it goes from being okay to pissing me off. And then I have to shave it. And when I shave it, uh, I have this experience, uh, exactly what you're talking about, this experience of like, uh, I'm clean, I'm like cleansed, I'm like centered again. I'm, yeah, it, yeah, it, it, I think it's it may sound like, crazy to people, but shaving like your head. It's like taking a Saturday bath. I mean, if you don't take a bath once a week, um, when you get that <laughs> bath, it, it just feels so good. Yeah, yeah, the, the warm water. We Folks, we had running water, I'm very proud to tell you. and we, I got baths every day growing up. 
And so um, maybe let's talk we a little bit. We haven't talked about entrepreneurship at all. Though. Yeah, let's talk about, about what uh, you let's, like to talk about. Let's talk maybe a little bit about entrepreneurship. Uh, yeah. I mean, you're an incredible entrepreneur, and your whole mission in life is to support uh, service uh, entrepreneurs. entrepreneurs. Yeah, I feel as you that's will know, like my total calling. Yeah, and uh, you and I share a huge passion around that because if it weren't for entrepreneurship, I'm I'm not sitting here, and I know you feel the same way. I think it's everything that's you know everything important comes out of entrepreneurship. Now a lot of people just got pissed off, but if they don't want to listen, it's okay. Because that's a, I really, that's a, this is a show that pisses a lot of people off, JB. Okay. <laughs> but entrepreneurs are the ones who create all the inventions. We're the ones so that, why, why do you think we're at an all-time low in American entrepreneurship? What the fuck's going I know, on? I don't, I don't really understand that um, because I'm experiencing, and you, you know, we all live in these little microcosms. I experience that more and more people want to be entrepreneurs, but it, it's probably because of the world I live. That's in. what you attract. Well, and actually, uh, I had no idea about this until uh, last, I think it was April. Uh, there was a story that came out in the Wall Street Journal, and the headline was The Crisis in American Entrepreneurship. And I looked at it, you know, I, I live in Santa Cruz, California, near, near Silicon Valley, and I used to live in Silicon Valley. And so, like you, all my world is entrepreneurship. And so I looked at this and said, what the fuck, are you crazy? And then I started to look at the numbers and the MIT and the Brookings Institute and all these people are starting to study it. And they say the reality in America is more companies die every week than are born. And, and the millennials are on track to be the less, the least entrepreneurial, uh, generation in American history. And so what do you think is going on with entrepreneurship, JB? You know, I'm not sure, but I think that um, maybe it's people trying to hold on to safety. Um, Because, I mean, I'm going to do some wild guessing here. If I, I was just having a conversation with myself yesterday about this. And and why do I talk to myself? Well, my (laughs) grandmother taught, taught me to do that. She lived with us. And as you know, it's so hard to find good conversation some days. Well, and as Tom Wade said, when I call myself up, I'm, I'm always there. <laughs> right? It's like, but, I, but I'm fair in my conversations in that I will have outright arguments with myself. I mean, I do take, so that's schizophrenia maybe, but I do take on different voices and, you know, and I'll have outright arguments, you know, uh, so I don't just take one side on the thing. But I was talking about, because I like, I like to look at economic forecasting. I find it fascinating. And right now, when I said, I look out the next three years, I have a hard time doing economic forecasting about housing, about stock markets, about the U.S. economy, about the world economy. I think the only thing I can forecast is that we're headed into a lot of chaos on lots of levels. And maybe people are picking that up and they think, it, they think completely erroneously that if somebody else is writing them the check, forgetting that they can go out of business, that somehow there's some safety here, which yeah. there isn't at all. Yeah. You know, one of the mantras of entrepreneurship I, I always love is um, uh, you're either making your own dreams come true or helping make somebody else's dreams come true. It, well, it, exactly. And, uh, and then now we talk about great teams, and I think – you know, all of us who are entrepreneurs do need teams. So they can't everybody be an entrepreneur. But uh, the good thing is it's not in most people's DNA. I think it's a DNA kind of thing for the most part. Um, but you can have teams where people get to be entrepreneurs or get to participate in that vision because that's really the kind of companies that interest me is some companies that have big impact visions. They want to do something that really matters and to me, that's when you pull together a team because people want to be a part of it. Well, it's interesting. Um, our friend Mike Maples, who was on a, a prior episode of Legends and Losers, he talks a lot about that um, the new entrepreneur he describes as a prime mover, somebody who really wants to make something happen in the world, and that prime movers create movements with their businesses. Yes. To, you know, to your point around right. purpose and making a difference, that prime movers establish whole new movements. I agree completely. And I think that prime movers attract fans that want to be a part of a movement. And I think what's kind of sad 
in the way a lot of things are working today in entrepreneurial, it's not really trainings, it's, um, hmm. Okay, there are organizations, there are companies, I'm going to come at this sideways. There are companies that we're all aware of that... We've got just, a lot of room for sideways here, <laughs> yeah. uh That, you know, let's just call it instant fame company. Well, just name it the instant fame company. And you go to them and they make you famous. The problem is you didn't do anything and you still have no substance after you got famous. But in today's world, that can happen. And then there's companies that it's all about how to create that movement or how to go out there. It's almost like artificial manipulation to get this fans. But in the end, if there's no substance, you really didn't do anything. Uh, And it's like um, Kardashians. Let's bash the Kardashians. Oh, let's, can we, here's what I want to know, JV. Why do I have to live in a country where I eat? I have to know who the fuck they are. I, I don't even oh, want they, to know who they, they are. So that's I don't a perfect care that example. Pretty Here is somebody they who look has, great in their dresses. I, I, I could give a they sh- have, There's no substance. They actually don't do anything. They cause no positive value in the world. But they're on CNN they're and famous. Fox News. They're famous. And they make all this money for being famous. That's exactly what I'm saying. And so there are companies that help entrepreneurs to become that. But if you become that, you still not, are, are not anything. You're still nothing. And I think that what's so great, and but again, it's the kind of people that I talk to because conscious million doesn't exactly attract people who are uninterested in the proposition. Let's do something right. with their life that matters. That's right. That's the only people I ever attract. because And, and that's great because that's the only people I want to deal with or be around. I want to be around people who want the world to be better. Absolutely. And, and you have built an incredible platform. Maybe we could spend a little bit of time there. Uh, um, you know, you're, I mean, 10 million people with your podcast and uh, a huge social media following. Um, and, and you help entrepreneurs think about reaching big audiences and, and, and kind of building businesses uh, digitally as well. So, you know, what are your thoughts on sort of... Um, how you build a, a, a digital business, whether it's with podcasting or your huge presence on social media. Yeah, Twitter. well, I think, I think the, the core question there to me is what's your platform? What's the platform that's going to be right for you? So, you know, it's interesting that although it took me seven years to write my book, my book and my podcast kind of came out about the same time. They both came out in 2014, um, which is really interesting. Since, uh, how so? Well, because the book gives me credibility. The book did become the number one book on Amazon, but it after that it hasn't like taken off. But part of the reason it hasn't taken off, admittedly, is that I lost my energetic interest uh, in in that journey, and it's because once I found this microphone thing right? Which was about three months before the book actually came out after you do all this work, because books don't, 320 page books that are well written don't just come out in 10 days, right? You've been working on this for quite a while. And then I realized I was so in love with this thing called the microphone. And had you know, it's like I didn't have any background in it at all. But it's like you find home. And I found home. That I just and, and what was it, along. JV, about podcasting in this microphone that was home? Yeah, that's a great question. So my first interview that I did was July eighth of two thousand fourteen. I did three interviews that day. You know, now I do six to seven, but that's after I went to ten a day and then pulled back. So I'm a batcher. So three, I put an hour between them because I said, oh, probably all kinds of things will go wrong. Um. And then the next week, I think I had another day I did three recordings. And maybe I had a second day. But then the third week, I had four or five in a day. And when I finished recording, I recall this so like it's just two seconds ago. Yeah. I sat back in my chair. And a lot of times, the truth or my path comes to me because I just say it. It just It's like... 
I channel it out of my mouth. I have no idea what I'm saying. It's right? you're, you're, you're creating the future real time. Right. As you're saying. So I go to the whiteboard. I have a, a, a four by 12 whiteboard because I'm a whiteboard addict. And then I'll just start writing. I don't know what I'm going to write. Or I'll pick up, you know, my journal and I'll start writing, but I don't know what I'm going to write. And it's like it channels through me. And um, a lot of the book was written that way, by the way. So at any rate, I sat back and I said, oh, my God, you just had your Oprah moment. And then I was still... What do you mean by Oprah moment? Exactly. That's what I was sat there wondering. I didn't say anything for about a minute. And um, I have to say the first thing that came to mind was, wow, Oprah made billions of dollars just talking to people. And then I was silent again because I thought, well, that is one level. But then I realized, hmm, that's not exactly what you meant. And I said, oh, my gosh, you found your calling. Now, what's interesting is that I already had Conscious Million. I already had a nonprofit called Conscious World. I thought that was my calling, but I had now gone to a deeper level. And within four weeks, well, I call it the little attorney's head shot up. And if you go to my website. What's a little attorney? <laughs> my, well, because I'm an attorney. So, but I don't. And, and we completely forgive you for that, JB. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, but I don't practice for I'm the public, kidding. which makes me a pretty good attorney. And uh, so every once in a while, the little attorney's head shoots up and says something. And the little attorney's head shot up and said, someday you're going to spin this off and you're going to have a media something. That's where you're headed. So on my website, I named it. I said Conscious Millionaire Media Division of Conscious Millionaire Institute, LLC. So it was already named. I still haven't spun it off, but I realized then, and, and this is before we launched. When I launched, I already had 60 shows in the can. So I, I recorded. You launched with 60 shows? Uh, absolutely. So I, wait, I want to make sure I understand when you when you were right. available for the first time right. on iTunes or yes. Stitcher, we already, SoundCloud. We already recorded sixty shows in two months. I and you just went boom. Shows. Here's sixty shows, mofo. No, I said boom. Here's three shows. <laughs> oh, okay. I already had my shows for like something like three or four. So months. why did you wait sixty shows in before you launched your podcast? Well, I had planned. That's... That wasn't the plan. Okay. I had planned to launch in a month. And I'd planned to launch two days a week. But a week before we were supposed to launch, I'm a very big believer in don't do something till you're ready. Okay? So I told my team, I said, we're not ready. We are not ready to launch, and we are not launching. And we didn't launch for another month after the time we but were supposed to launch. But you kept shooting shows. Yes, but I had all these shows already scheduled. Yeah. And so I kept recording all these shows. And then right. about three weeks before we launched, one night I went, Oh, you're going to have 60 shows when you launch. You better do it more than twice a day, or these people are going to be a little upset they don't come out for a year. <laughs> and I launched yeah. at five days at five days a week, and now we're seven days a week. So I Amazing. only went forward. And Amazing. Uh, but the thing is, I knew and, this is where I belonged. And I'm curious, uh, <clears throat> what do you think the difference is it, it has made to you being seven days a week? Well, I added the sixth day. Um, sep the third week of September, because that's the of 2016, because that started our third year. So I was beginning to get restless and wanting to do some things. And I had been thinking about adding a weekend show for about six months. I just wasn't sure what it was yet. Now I love it. I love doing the weekend show and people really love it. It's the weekend mojo. I only record for seven minutes. By the time you put the front end and the back end and all that, it's a 10 minute show. People love it. I found it took me about three weeks to find a format or you know, how was I going to do What you it? wanted to do, yeah. Yep. And then the health show, once the diabetes thing started happening. That became uh, that's, clarity, right? Well, that's uh, that's its own podcast, but then I bring it over on, Wednesday, on, on Sundays. What comes out on Wednesday on the health podcast comes and replays on Sunday because I want to reach as big an audience as possible with this message that, that really now it's kind of found itself. The message yeah. is there's a blue pill, there's a red pill, you can take the blue pill, but you're sick for life, or you can take the red pill and heal. Which one do you want? I took the red pill, and then I share everything I'm doing every week. And what do you think is the secret to the success of getting to 10 million with the podcast? I think the secret was, well, when I decided to do the podcast, I told my team, I said, this is going to be big. It's going to be really big uh, because it's that intuitive thing. I said, I don't know how 
but I know that I'm supposed to do it. So I think the secret, because only now my, in the last six months, I've made a lot of technical changes to the show. I mean, I just redid the script again for the 20 millionth time uh, for how I'm doing the show. It, it's, it's Dharma. It's, it, it's my path. Uh, I'm supposed to be doing this. And I simply listen to what I believe I'm supposed to be doing and I do it. Now, now I'm beginning to train. April, I'm going to do my first training uh, where I'm going to train other people and I'm going to teach them differently. Because how to I'm going do to, podcasting. How to pick podcasting. But I've also, only two weeks ago did I start doing this. So it's a grand experiment. Um, there's no longer anything on my website that you can, other than the initial you know, tripwire, quote unquote. But if you want to be in the First Million Academy, if you want coaching with me, if you want to be in the podcast training, you have to apply and we actually have to have a phone call. Now, we're going to see how where that goes, but I'm looking for a particular kind of person now. So and I what, want to be what sure kind of person match. do you want to work with? I want to be sure that the person I'm working with really wants to change the world. That's critical to me. I want to only invest my time. And in you're really looking to uplift the, the small service entrepreneur, aren't you? Yeah, ab- absolutely. The, the, the solopreneur the or the very... The, the, the solopreneur, the small business person who's maybe breaking out of a corporate environment and, and trying to set a new path for themselves. Yeah. I mean, my largest clients are like three to five million in revenue. Yeah. Um, and, and I like that group of people because, you know, these are people, some of them will go on to build bigger companies, but let's face it. If you can figure out how to get to a half million to a million in profits a year. That's a very good income and you're touching a lot of people's lives and you're making a difference and you're setting an example for other people and you have the means to give to causes you care about. That's a very nice life. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I know there's something you want to uh, uh, share with legends and losers listeners. So um, l- let's talk about what, what, what that well, now, is. You said this was a 12 hour interview. Are you kind of hinting that it's not? Well, we have no time limit. We can go as long as you fucking want, JV. And you're, you're a guy who's learned a lot about a lot. So uh, uh, we are taping this on today. I, I, is, I, do, I do. I do want to share. Today, it's, so it's a Friday night, isn't it? No, <laughs> no it's a Monday night, dude. And I've got Orange Theory in the morning, um, and then a then a group training in the afternoon, and a bunch Atta of boy. stuff to stuff to record in the meantime. I think um, a good friend of mine, Rodna Britton, who you might know, won Emmy. She was one of the first reality TV shows for three years, life coach, did 600 episodes. And she's been on my show several times. One of the things that she said I think is really critical, that a lot of times people get the idea that you've got to do this marketing and this marketing and this marketing and this marketing and this marketing. No, no, you don't. You need to find what's right for you. You know, it's like there's another book in me that will probably come out in the next two or three years. But, you know, that's fine. Uh, I love the media. I mean, I think that I'm more curious about how many new things can I do in media? Can I have TV shows? Can I, You know, what all can I do in media? When you find something that it just feels like the two things that I love the most in life in business are podcasting and coaching. And actually in that order, although I love coaching, but podcasting is the best gig in town. I get to interview all these amazing people like yourself who've been on my show. We spend an hour together. Thanks it's again such, for having me. <laughs> it's such, a, But it's such an incredible gig. It, it, it is. It really is. And, uh, I mean, obviously you're the veteran master and I'm just getting started. But I, I, I get exactly what you're saying, JV. I mean, you get to have amazing conversations with amazing people um, right. many times a week. And, and and then you share them with millions of people who, you know, who get to listen in on these conversations. And that's at the very, if we go back to the very beginning, 2014, July, the thing I realized before I ever did my first recording, I kind of sat and thought about it. And I said, and I created a, you know, I've never shared this on a podcast. I created an, uh, you know, almost like an avatar, but I created an avatar of what did I want my podcast to be, right? And I wanted it to be like it was an NPR show, and and the listeners were getting to listen in on this incredible conversation I was having with someone. And 
I'm pleased to tell you, I think it still is that, right? That I get to have these great conversations with people and people fortunately want to listen in. And the one thing that I've, I think one of the things that the diabetes journey has opened to me in a new way is that I am aware of how much love and compassion I have. Um, and not just compassion because, oh, you got diabetes too or something like that. But I literally have started saying it. it, it the, the shows aren't out yet, but I've started saying it in all my podcast recordings and talking to, because I talk to the people who are listening and telling people, you know, openly that I love them and that I care about them. And I didn't use that love word before, but. So uh, I, I have to interrupt you. So uh, what was it? I mean, Love is not exactly a word you hear that often in business. What was it that caused you to start to tell people? Ta- ta- tell people that I love them uh, who are listening to my podcast because I feel it, because it's in my heart, because I genuinely want the best for them. And the diabetes has touched me. I feel on a daily basis that I could pretty much fly off the side of a building. Because I'm going, by golly, if you can heal diabetes, you could heal cancer, and you could heal this, and you could heal that, and you could do this. So it's it's like when my dad died. My dad was 90. He had Parkinson's. He had a stroke. And I told the doctors right off, I said, look, I'm not a sugar coat kind of guy. Just tell me because I have to make decisions. They said he's going to die in three to four months. I said, okay, now I know. And I shut down my business, and I was with him 12 hours a day, and he died two days short of four months. But a month into this, they said, he's not doing so well. You need to make funeral arrangements. So I ended up making funeral arrangements for three months. And one of the decisions that I made, so I ended up with this incredible funeral for my father. Um, But one of the decisions I made early on was that I was going to do a eulogy. I actually ended up with four eulogies. I did the fourth one. So I closed, closed it out and brought it together. And I knew that for me, it was going to be the most difficult thing because my father happened to have been my best friend. So that's a little different parent relationship than everybody has. Um, so I knew it was going to be really, really hard, but I also knew it was going to be really, really powerful. And in fact, uh, if I can, I'll just share this because I think the way I approached this was a bit unique. Um, I happen to have, spent seven times with my father privately after he died. I spent an hour with him and explained the funeral and everything and went through it all so he'd know. And three times before, like the day after he died, I went back over to the funeral home and, you know, was working with some more arrangements. And I said, I want to see my dad. And they said, you, you, you know, there's no makeup. There's nothing. I said, that's fine. I met with the makeup person three times to get my father's makeup right because he had rooty skin. And she says, I've never done this with anyone. And I'm so grateful because I always just have a picture and I have no idea if they look right. And we worked on it three times. And then I had my father lay in state for a full day in their chapel. And it was the day before the funeral. And I still hadn't written the eulogy. So I was getting a little concerned because I'm kind of the, you know, I was getting a little concerned at that point. But at any rate, I reserved five hours with my father just for myself. And I took a card table over. I took my uh, laptop. Um, and I would go and talk to my father. And I'd come back and I'd write more of the eulogy. And then I'd go talk to my father. And I'll, I'll cry down. But it was uh, such an amazing experience to have that. And then... I practiced it once, but I was just crying the whole time. So I decided that that was a very, very bad idea. (laughs) One should not practice a eulogy. One should just figure out how to get through the damn thing. And I did. And it was so amazing. And And the next day I said to myself, this explains why the diabetes has been so powerful for me. I said, if I did that, what else can I do that I didn't think I could do? Right? Because because you didn't think you'd get that. Yeah, because it's like, oh, how am I going to get through this, right? How can I even make it through this experience? Um, But I did, you know, and and I was, you know, afterwards people going, oh, my God, that was so amazing. And I said, you know, all all I was happy for was that I actually made it through and didn't break down a million times. Um, And I think that's what's happening to me with this diabetes. And I'm going, wait a minute, if I can actually heal 
something that Western medicine says can even be healed. And I seem to be doing a pretty damn good job of it. And then share the story with a lot of other people because it really makes me angry that people are being told they have to be sick the rest of their lives when it's a blatant lie. It's just not true. But isn't and, that really, uh, JB, a um, sort of a hallmark of your life that you, you haven't accepted any barrier that's been put in front of you, whether it was the candy bars or, uh, right. or the diabetes <laughs> or, or anything in between? I think it is kind of my path. And and the thing is, what's most important to remember about that is that I'm not unique. I, I'm just a human being going through this thing with all of my struggles and all of my stuff and, you know, the times I feel depressed. And, you know, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm just going through this journey and I want – to help other people go through their journey at whatever's the highest level for them so that they can live the highest level and make their, their biggest difference. Because when everything's said and done, I think that all, it's kind of funny because the attorneys I was working with when I sold some companies, they said, oh, so now you've made it. And I said, no. I said, the only way I'll ever know if I made it is on my last day I'm on this earth and I look back and I am able to truly say I lived my purpose. And if I can't say yeah. that, I didn't make it at all. Yeah. And you can't know that. And I, I, love, I love that you've used uh, your diabetes to double down on your mission. Thank you. Yeah. 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 You make a giant difference in the world, JB, and you make a difference to um, millions of people with your podcast and thousands of people with your training and your book and, and uh, with your coaching. And uh, you've been incredibly generous today. Hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah, really opening opening up your heart and talking about your dad and and um, where you are in your life. And uh, I'm really stoked for you, man. Um, well, and I I appreciate you using the word generous because um, um, that's something that people have said to me like for decades, but I actually don't have any connection to that. What do you mean? Um that I don't know that I'm generous because to me, I'm just being me. I don't feel any particular, like it doesn't seem generous just to be yourself. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I, I, I never can fully, I never can fully, I can understand people saying that, but I never can fully know what that means. Cause I don't actually feel generous. One of I my favorite, one of my favorite you know? stories about this JV is, and I don't know if it's a true story, but it's a great fucking story. All right. Uh, let's suppose, say it's true. Let's just say it's true. It's, it sounds good. It's true. Uh, supposedly when Michelangelo was asked about his famous sculpture, David and yeah. how he created Which I've it. I've seen several times. Yeah. I actually got a chance to see it when I was in Paris uh, years ago, but um apparently what he said was, well, it was easy. All I did was remove everything that wasn't David. And in our lives, of course, the way many of us find who we are is we remove all the shit that isn't us, right? And when you remove all that shit and you can just be yourself, um, then you're finally free. And, you know, for uh, for somebody like you who's as big of a kind of um, a podcast and social media and star that you are and, I, you know, best-selling author, you know, to come on and share your life like this is is, is great. So I really want to thank you for that. Well, thank you for, for having me. I, I love the world we're living in. And it's, I, I think that podcasting is just the beginning of a new world, but we've only begun. And it's well, isn't it really amazing that, to see where it goes. Isn't it amazing that you've created a one man media empire? <laughs> well, what's amazing is that, that how many people can do that, right? Is yeah. Like, uh, like, I mean, I think it's kind of fun, you know, like, People in 186 countries actually listen to me. Yeah, so, right. And then you have friends that like go, "You've got to be joking." And I'm like, "No, actually, it's true." Um, my my wife can't believe anybody listens to me about anything. <laughs> right. That, that's kind of the the thing. Yeah, it's like I think most of my it is definitely true. Most of my long term friends do not listen to my podcast. I, you know, uh, they they're still having to deal with um, every once in a while when I'm going to be like I'm going to speak or I'm going to do something. Um, you know how we all have neuroses and um, our neuroses typically are are so absurd that they're only neurotic to us. I mean, like like 
anyone looking on would go, this is impossible. But my greatest fear is that I have nothing to say. That is my greatest fear. I know. I know. Well, I, my <laughs> friends look at me and they go, they go, I have a hard time. It's impossible that you have nothing to say. You never shut up. And I go, oh, but maybe I'll just run out of stuff to say, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, uh, I highly doubt that. And I, um, uh, God knows your uh, millions of fans around the world don't want that to happen. Well, I want to invite your people to my to my live training. Can I do that? Absolutely. Tell them what you okay, got going. So I have a live training, and I love the live training. It's called First Million Webinar, and it's specifically designed for service business coaches, consultants, speakers, entrepreneurs who want to make a difference, and you want to get to your first million. So what I do is I've honed it down because I'm a systems guy, and I love doing this kind of thing, and I have the five proven steps that you need to take. And if you take them, you can move forward with your business. And I want to give you that training absolutely free. All you have to do is go sign up for it. And it's consciousmillionaire.com forward slash first million and uh, claim your seat. And uh, I have questions and answers at the end. So we get a chance to talk as well. That's awesome, Jimmy. Thank you so much. And, um, Thank you for your time. Like I said, you've been generous and you've been open and you've been real and you've been candid. And uh, it's really been a pleasure being with you tonight. Thank thanks, you, buddy. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening. If you like this episode, you'll probably like episode 19 with the legendary social media giant uh, author of Shareology and H2H, Brian Kramer. Uh, would like to remind you that uh, I am on tour with NetSuite, uh, the number one company in cloud ERP. Uh, if you want information on the tour, go to legendsandlosers.com slash NetSuite tour. And if you want an invite to uh, one of the executive events, send email to blackhole at legendsandlosers.com and we'll get an invite out to you. We'll be in San Diego, August 24th, Toronto, Canada. How's it going, eh? September 19th. New York, New York, September 20th. And uh, we might even have a special sighting of Kevin Maney there if we can uh, entice him. September 20th, New York. September 26th, Denver, Colorado, one of my favorite cities. Uh, October 25th in the beautiful San Francisco. And October, excuse me, November, November 9th, we'll be getting hot in Miami. Please subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Remember, this podcast is not free. We would love it if you gave us a legendary review. You can find us on the interweb at legendsandlosers.com, facebook.com slash groups slash legends and losers. And um, we're going to be doing a lot more live events. So if you're part of our Facebook group, that's where we'll be doing the vast majority of them. Facebook.com slash groups slash legends and losers. Twitter at legends and losers. And the email again, blackhole at legendsandlosers.com. We would like to thank HarperCollins Instant Classic Play Bigger, how pirate streamers and innovators create and dominate markets. Equity Directory, connecting startups to the talent and resources they need to build a legendary business. Our good friends at OneLifeFullyLive.org, the nonprofit helping you live, excuse me, dream, plan, and live, ha ha, your best life. NetSuite number one in cloud ERP. Our good friends at Interview Valet Podcast Interview Marketing. Get yourself on some podcasts and make something legendary in your business happen. The Creative Warrior Podcast with our good friend, Jeffrey Shaw. The legendary 1185 Design. There's a reason Silicon Valley's greatest brands go to 1185. Bixen2 at Bixen2.com. Future hacking for executives who want to produce material outcomes. One of the top podcasts in the world, Achieve Your Goals with Hal Elrod and now John Berghoff. Habitat for Humanity, Building New Futures. Tahoe Truckee Homes, Make Your Tahoe Dream Come True. TahoeTruckeeHomes.com. And of course, the Museum of Failure in beautiful Sweden. Shout out to Sweden at museumoffailure.se. Project Relo, the new movie is out. Veterans Work, the Project Relo story on YouTube. Our friends at 800 CEO Read, business books, don't be a loser, read something. Pursuingresults.com, they produce legendary podcasts. Hey, Matt. And whose t-shirt I'm wearing today, 
Paradigm Sport in beautiful Santa Cruz, California. Train like it happens. We'd like to remind you that today's information is provided to you solely for informational purposes. This Oddcast is a sole property of the Legends and Losers Oddcast Network, and we would love it if you shared the shit out of it. We'd like to warn you that Legends and Losers is produced in a studio that definitely contains nuts, and we never do any animal testing. Teach entrepreneurship. Do not hold the wrong end of a chainsaw. Be nice to your mother. Keep your eyes on the road and your hands upon the wheel. God bless Adam West. <laughs> Introduce two people you love to two podcasts you love. And hey, Colin, wherever you are, don't forget this podcast really ties the room together. And we have to apologize to Oscar Munoz, the CEO of United Airlines. Oscar, we just ran out of time for you. Thanks, my legendary friends. 